Welcome to What Gisters Need to Know About Clinical Trials, Clinical Trials 101, A Gistery of Clinical Trials, and How to Talk to Your Medical Team About Clinical Trials. During this seminar, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation using questions submitted through the Q&A feature. Please remember the information provided in this web seminar is not intended as a substitute for your physician's guidance and care. My name is Sarah Rothschild, the VP of Program Services, and I would like to introduce our presenters for today. We would like to thank Daichi Sankyo, Decipher Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, and Pfizer for their unrestricted educational grants for today's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. Dr. David Josephi is president of LifeRef Group Canada and an LRG science team member. David was a professor of molecular and cellular biology at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada until his recent retirement. He's authored a textbook titled Molecular Toxicology and has written more than 100 scientific publications in biochemistry, toxicology, and cancer research. And Jim Hughes serves many roles at the LifeRef Group. Some of them include allergy board member, LifeRef Group clinical trials coordinator, allergy science team member, as well as facilitator of the Allergy Chicago chapter. We're really excited for them to present today and I'd like to hand this off to now David to begin. Thank you, Sarah. And I'll, I'll begin by sharing my screen. I hope this will work smoothly. Usually it does. How does that look? Good. Okay, welcome everyone. I want to tell you a little bit about clinical trials. This is not my expertise, but I uh, think I can uh, give you a little bit of background that may be useful to you. Um, so without further ado, I'll just go ahead. I'm going to try and keep this quite simple so that uh, and quite short so that Jim can have time to talk more specifically. I'm going to talk more generally about clinical trials. And I think Jim will take you through uh, the history of some of the GIST specific clinical trials. And I'm going to rely, which is to say I've copied most of my presentation out of a book uh, published almost 10 years ago called Cancer Clinical Trials. I think it's out of print now, but you may be able to get a copy online. Uh, it, it's a little bit dated now, but still a very good introduction. I don't know of any other uh, introduction with the same kind of focus and uh, insight that this book has. So I do recommend it. Cancer Clinical Trials, A Common Sense Guide to Experimental Cancer Therapies and Clinical Trials. And as it says in the book, clinical trials are experiments but they're highly organized, often very complex experiments that test new therapies in volunteers. And, you know, we often think about clinical trials in the context of new drugs, particularly new drugs or drug combinations for GIST, but it's a more general concept than that. Although we won't go into it today, one can also have clinical trials, of, for example, radiology techniques, surgical developments, new diagnostic techniques, and even clinical trials of preventive approaches like anti-estrogens in breast cancer. But we're going to focus primarily on the clinical trials of new drugs. Before one enters a clinical trial, and again, I'm taking this from the book I referred to at the beginning, but these are good general pointers. One would want to ask before entering any trial, what are the possible benefits? What are the possible risks? What will happen to me during the trial? I mean, what is required of me as a volunteer in the trial? How long will it last? And who's going to pay for the costs? And that could be not just the drug itself, which normally would be covered by the uh, pharma, but it could also involve medical examinations, travel, and so on. So these are questions one wants to have answered clearly before beginning. This again is a quotation from the book, but it's, it's a, inst an instructive comment. Nearly one in three of clinical trials fail to enroll even a single patient. 
and about half of planned clinical trials fail to attract enough participants to finish the job, to reach a conclusion, even where they, when they're conducted at dozens of medical centers. So there's no question, there are a lot of clinical trials out there, a lot more than actually come to fruition. And their conclusion, and I think, it's, I think everyone in Life Raft group would agree, is that greater participation in clinical trials would speed the development of new cancer treatments. It, it really is an important hurdle that has to be overcome in developing new treatments. We need, generally need greater participation in clinical trials. And I think that's one of the reasons why Life Raft Group is sponsoring this talk, I think. So let's go through the phases of a clinical trial just very briefly, because clinical trials can be conducted at different phases of drug development. I, I'm going to look specifically here about development of new drugs. And let's just go briefly through the phases of trials that you might be involved, might be in uh, part participating in. So phase one is safety testing. This is really for a new drug. It may be the first time it's tested in human beings rather than uh, experimental animals or in vitro systems. The end point for phase one is simply to test the safety of a new drug at various doses. It's not primarily designed to look at efficacy or or the outcome of treatment with the drug, although that, of course, may be will be monitored. But the main issue here is to test the safety of a new drug in preparation for going into the later phase. Well, why would anyone volunteer for a phase one study? I think there are two major factors why you might want to volunteer and a couple of factors why you might not. And I think these are, are, are fairly clear when you think about them. Uh, in, in terms of reasons for volunteering, well, you can get access to the latest drugs. And that in turn means there's the potential to participate in a treatment breakthrough. And of course, in the history of just clinical trials, we know that that has very much been true in some favorable cases that patients have benefited. In fact, patients have had their lives saved by getting early access into, a, into a, an early clinical trial. But why might one be shy? Why might one wish to avoid a phase one study? Well, of course, there is the risk of unknown or unanticipated side effects. And that can happen in the, when the drug is first tried in patients. I think it's also fair to acknowledge that the chances of clinical success are relatively low. A lot of new drugs fail or fail to be better than existing treatment. And so that might be a factor for deterring participation. It's a, it's a balance as with everything else. Phase two then, a phase two trial is designed to test efficacy. That is to answer the question, does the drug work clinically? Uh, according to the uh, book that I'm quoting, and I think it's a fair comment, phase two trials are really the workhorses of cancer treatment research. This is really the, uh, the critical phase at which a lot of drugs either succeed or fail. It is ethically appropriate to do a clinical trial like this when there is no effective alternative treatment for the patients being considered for the trial. These trials are usually conducted on small groups. It could be from just a handful of patients up to perhaps a few hundred, relatively small groups of patients. Two concepts we want to be uh, clear about here, randomization. Not always, but very often, a phase two trial will be randomized. For example, patients may be randomly um, sorted, randomly chosen to be treated in, with two different doses of the drug. That was true of some of the early uh, clinical trials of imatinib for GIST. People were randomized between a higher and a lower dose of the drug. 
And these two different uh, patient groups, these two different sides of the study, we refer to as arms, the different arms of the study. It could be two or it could be more than two. Often it's, it's two. Another important feature you may hear about here is crossover. So for example, a, a trial may include the provision that if a patient is on the lower dose treatment arm and undergoes progression or the treatment is not effective, they may be crossed over. That is, they may be moved partway through the clinical trial into the higher dose group to try and benefit the patient. That's what, what we call a crossover design. Not always part of a clinical trial, and one can ask for a specific trial you're considering, you can ask whether crossover is incorporated. The principle of equipoise as uh, formalized in 1987, although it's really been used for a long time, one way or the other. So here I'm just quoting from a Wikipedia description of equipoise. A trial always begins with what a statistician calls a null hypothesis. You begin with the hypothesis that there's no evidence that the drug being tested will be better than the existing treatments. Or to put it another way, there must be genuine uncertainty over whether the new treatment will be beneficial. If there is not genuine uncertainty, if you're convinced, if the medical community is convinced that the new treatment will be beneficial, then it's ethically inappropriate to deny that treatment to some patients by having a randomized clinical trial. As the trial progresses, the findings of the trial may already begin to provide evidence of efficacy. That's often been the case. And so it's concluded that once a certain threshold of evidence is crossed, there may no longer be equipoise. There may no longer be genuine uncertainty. And at that point, typically, ethically, one has to break the coding on the trial and begin providing the successful treatment to all of the participants in the trial. And that's often happened. Do want to put a, a, a caution here. It seems in a way obvious that if a new drug is working, then you stop the trial and you make that drug available to everybody if it's working. But it's not so simple. As several doctors have pointed out in the last few years, there is a real danger or risk here. It's like a gambler. If you imagine, imagine a, a, a playoff series in baseball or hockey, if the rule is that once a given team goes ahead by three or four games, then you stop the, the series, then that's unfair. You really ought to, if it's a seven or eight or nine game series, whatever, you ought to play the whole series and see who wins. You don't just stop it because somebody won the first three games. So that's a sort of quit while you're ahead philosophy or, or what you could call a lucky winning streak. And it's been pointed out that it, it, there is a risk. Some clinical trials, and I'm not going to go through the examples here, but there are quite a few actually. Some clinical trials have been stopped prematurely because it looked like they were working statistically. But later in a larger trial, it turned out that the therapy didn't work. So this is particularly an issue when you have uh, trials with a small number of patients, as is often true in a GIST trial. So it's so something to bear in mind. Another aspect of trials that you've probably heard about and is debated a lot, and that's the question of what we call blinding or sometimes called masking and the use of placebos. So the intent here is to remove the possibility of an unintentional bias resulting from the fact that either the patient or the physician or both have expectations about the trial. So you could well imagine that whether consciously or unconsciously, if a patient knows that he or she is taking a new drug that may be effective, there is a psychological tendency, maybe a, a prejudice, to understate 
side effects because he wanted the drug to be approved and to work. And so to remove that unintentional bias, we often have a blinded study. So that can happen in a number of ways. Double blind means that neither the patients in the trial nor the doctors know which treatment is being used. Everything is independently coded and the doctor doesn't know and neither does the patient. Now that in some situations is impossible. An obvious case would be when a new surgical technique is being tested. The doctor obviously knows what, what, which technique he's using, so it can't be blinded to the physician. Maybe it can be blinded to the patient, maybe not. So that's another design of a trial, which we call single blind. In that case, the doctor inevitably knows, but the patient does not know the design of the trial, or which, which arm of the trial they're in. Phase three clinical trials. Here we're doing a, the doctors are doing a comparison of the new treatment with the existing standard of care. This would only be done if the phase two trial showed promise, promise of success. So a phase three trial would be done with a larger number of patients than the phase two trial. It would involve a direct comparison of the new treatment to the existing standard of care. And it involves typically larger numbers. It could be up to thousands of patients, depending on the conditions. Unfortunately, many treatments that looked successful in phase one or phase two subsequently failed at phase three. There's also people talk about a phase, so-called phase four trial. One might have not even regarded as a clinical trial, but by phase four, we mean that after the drug has been approved, for example, by the FDA, you still monitor the outcome in the real world. And so that can be called a phase four clinical trial after approval intended to refine the use of a drug after it's been approved. It may or may not be done, I think. A last topic I want to talk about last couple of topics. Uh, I'm sorry, Jim, if I'm going on a little too long, but I'll try and wind it up now. So there, you, you will have heard a lot of talk about real world evidence. So I want to just highlight the difference between what we've discussed up to this point, a randomized clinical trial or an RCT versus on the other hand, real world evidence. So real-world evidence is obtained from the real use of an approved therapy or drug. It's based on analysis of large amounts of data. That data could come from claims submitted to an insurance company or hospital billing data, or it could come from patient-generated data from a disease registry like the one that LifeRaft Group keeps. It's not a randomized trial. It's what's actually happening as the therapy is used. And in the last few years, the FDA in the US has been required to develop guidance on using RWE for post-approval studies. And in fact, the LifeRaft group in the US has an RWE working group, which is continually monitoring real world evidence on drugs. Now I just say at the bottom of this slide, because it's relevant to to the current situation. The COVID-19 vaccine trials are a clear illustration of the difference between RCT and RWE. For example, the virus was mutating and evolving. As we all know, we hear about Delta and Lambda and the other variants of the virus. So there are lots of, there have already been lots of situations where the vaccine trial was done in a population where, for example, the original version, original form of the virus was prevalent. But by the time it was actually put in, implemented into clinical practice in the population, the virus had evolved into the Delta or Lambda variant. And so, in fact, the real world evidence is obtained on a quite different clinical situation with a different form of the virus. So there have been cases where people were surprised or even outraged that the efficacy of a vaccine proved to be different in the real world from what it was in the clinical trial. But that's not surprising. You would expect that to be the case. 
So I've just got a summary here of the difference between randomized clinical trials and real world evidence. Just go that, through that briefly. So in terms of the number of patients, typically real world is going to be larger because you've now expanded this drug into the whole population. The eligibility criteria for a clinical trial can be very rigid. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but typically there will be very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria as to who is allowed into the trial. But by the time the drug or vaccine or whatever is being used in the general population, you no longer have those rigid criteria. So in fact, you're looking at a qualitative, qualitatively different population of patients. The randomized clinical trials will normally do, be done at academic research centers with typically very specialized physicians monitoring them. Whereas when you get into the real world, the drug is going to be used in community hospitals and clinics with le probably less thorough monitoring of compliance and follow-up. So it's a different situation. One can say then that real world evidence better reflects the actual clinical environments in which the medical inventions, interventions are being used. And that means real world in ter terms of patient demographics, possible comorbidities, which might have been excluded in the clinical trial, differences in anti adherence and other concurrent treatments and so on. So, this is really a, a very important uh, and lively topic nowadays in the medical community. As it says at the bottom of this slide, it, we know that, there are, that the real world evidence may be more directly relevant to real practice, but it also is at risk of biases and errors in terms of the reporting of the outcome. So we have to be cautious about, about uh, interpreting that evidence. And I think I will now skip through the remainder because I'm running over my time. And I'll just conclude it at that point and turn it over to Jim. And we can take questions later, right? Thank you. And right. now I'll stop sharing my screen and figure out how to do that. There we go. OK, done. OK, um, I've turned on my audio. Can, can you hear me, David? Yep, very good. OK, I want to be sure we got that on. All right, so let me share my screen. OK, uh, should be a slide up that says LRG Clinical Trials Webinar, Jim Hughes. David, do you see that? Yeah, it's up. OK, thanks. Yes, I do. Uh, all right, great. Uh, I'm Jim Hughes. Um, my wife Margie's here with me today. Uh, she's sitting and listening right next to me here. And I would uh, like to just dedicate the next 20 minutes or so to our daughter, Nancy. Nancy was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 23 in 1991. At the time, it was called lyomyosarcoma. Uh, many patients at that time were, with GIST were diagnosed with that. It was 10 years later that we learned it was GIST. Nancy, in that time, uh, at that time, after the 10 years, participated in two clinical trials, the phase three Gleevec trial in 2001 and the phase two Sinitinib trial in 2003. Both drugs would be approved for GIST and eventually help patients worldwide. So we are very proud of our daughter, Nancy, uh, for having undertaken to go through that. But at the same time, we also realize as patients look at clinical trials today, sometimes you just don't have options and a clinical trial is the best thing to try to manage your disease. Uh, back when Gleevec was first introduced, it was the only thing that would really take care of uh, GIST. So we lived with Nancy when she went through the um, phase two Sutton trial. Uh, we were, she was at Dana-Farber in Boston and we lived in a small uh, town called Brookline outside of Boston where there was a, a patient uh, hospice house where we could uh, live uh, in between exams and Nancy had to live there full time for three months. So we met uh, 12 other GIST patients. Uh, we were living in the same kitchen, living room, separate bedroom. Sometimes we shared baths. Uh, so we really got to know a lot of patients. Uh, they're all gone now, those patients are, but we still are in touch with some of their caregivers. We live, literally lived through that Soton trial with Nancy um, 
uh, in the 2003. Um, I am not a medical professional. And so again, I wanna be sure the disclaimer is here, the information provided here should be discussed with your doctor. Um, I sort of, when I did this, I started to go through and say, oh, we'll do the history and then we'll discuss uh, current trials and then we'll discuss um, um, a little bit about Nancy's experience. I kind of reversed that. I wanna give you the current trials first because I don't wanna run out of time. And I wanna be sure you see what is currently available and have the resources to do your own search if you'd like to. So that's gonna be upfront. Um, this is a picture of Nancy in March of 1991. It was taken after surgery that removed four tumors and half her stomach in January. This was a five week stay in the hospital because of the complications, primarily a thrombo uh, in her leg that uh, was not expected. She, uh, would soon start chemo right after this picture was taken. This is a picture with her with her first car. So when you get diagnosed with cancer, the first thing you do is you run out and you buy a car. Uh, <laughs> she'd been working for several years and she paid cash from her savings because a loan costs more, which would tell you a little bit about Nancy. Um, in discussions with your doctor, I can give you one example. Nancy's actual discussion with her senior oncologist who just diagnosed her cancer. Nancy, do you have other leiomyosarcoma patients? The oncologist, yes. Nancy, how many? Oncologist, two. Nancy, lifetime or since you were here at this hospital? Oncologist, lifetime. Nancy, what is your score with those patients? Oncologist, one for two. Um, sort of the reality then of leiomyosarcoma, which is maybe a little more rare than GIST, but certainly still the reality for many patients who have GIST and are informed for the first time by their oncologist what they have, and uh, maybe don't go through it as frankly as Nancy did, but certainly have these questions and are seeking answers. In that vein, I, I put together some sample questions that you can use to begin the discussion about clinical trials with your oncologist. I, I like the first one is just ask the open-ended question, clinical trials, and see what happens. Uh, you might get an open-ended uh, response to that. The others here are a little more uh, to the point variations. Do you have GIST patients who are in clinical trials? Has this facility sponsored GIST trials? Have you been an investigator? One I like is, can you help me develop treatment plans, including clinical trial options as appropriate? Um, I also like, would you feel comfortable helping me select a clinical trial option if that were appropriate? And lastly, one that I think was very important for us, if, if I choose a clinical, uh, outside clinical trial, can you work with the principal investigator and the trial team to coordinate my care here at home? That was extremely important for us Nancy had an excellent uh, oncologist in here in Evanston, and he worked very closely with uh, George Dimitri's team at Dana-Farber during both trials. And uh, we were very fortunate to find that combination of somebody locally willing to work like that. So researching clinical trials, what are the resources that are out there? There are two resources that we use. Um, we build one called the LRG Curated Database of GIST Trials. I'm responsible in part for that. Um, it's updated from the National Institute of Health. Uh, it includes trials that do not specify GIST, but have relevance in GIST. It does not include all observational studies. It includes links to trial reports and drug specific web pages that you really just don't find anyplace else. So we think it's unique in that regard. Also, we're not following every foreign country uh, that has now clinical trials in GIST. In China, it's very hard to follow because it's not always transparent, but there's some interesting things going on in China. We see that and where appropriate, we put those trials up. There's also the NIH uh, US National Library of Medicine, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Oh, uh, by the way, these links that are here, I'm gonna open a, a chat um, if I can find out how to do that. Well, oh, I guess I can't while I'm sharing. But I will open up. I can chat do that for you. And, and I will paste uh, in there the links that I'm using here today, plus some others, and my contact information. I've added that, Sarah, 
So I will do that when I get down to the uh, last few slides here. Okay, so um, you can do a search in clinicaltrials.gov and you'll, you'll get all the GIST trials that are and that aren't actually. Uh, you can narrow your selection by to recruiting and not yet recruiting and use advanced search to filter even further to the US. Or you can look at a map and see just your state and see just the trials that are appropriate that are just trials that are being offered and recruiting in your state. So that's a very helpful resource and I'll have a, a graphic from that in a minute. Um, but um, we do well keep ours up to date and we do like it because it is curated and we make every effort to be sure that the trials there are relevant for GIST. There are some there that say they uh, provide for GIST. Uh, we do follow them. They may not have many GIST patients, but we want to be sure we know the outcome for those patients. So it's really um, exploratory for us to keep, keep those, pa um, those trials in the database and to follow them and see what's happening. Um, so we do not include chemotherapy trials. We try to exclude those. So what are the current trials for GIST? Uh, I want to go through that in a minute, but I want to emphasize again, phase one is safety and uh, it's uh, appropriate dose. It also is almost always for solid tumors, which will include GIST, but it's not clear whether it does or not. In some cases, it's not clear at all. Efficacy, it's almost always going to say GIST. Uh, in that select condition. Although we do have trials that still say solid tumors in that, at that point, but they uh, do include a large percentage of GIST. Lastly, this is always GIST, phase three, superiority to a current approved GIST therapy or a placebo. Um, so that, uh, that's always uh, the final step. While well, phase two is the bread and butter, uh, the, the heart of this and getting things started. Phase three is dealing with the FDA and assert, uh, assuring us that this is better than an alternative that's already out there. So here is a list of what's currently available. I think uh, 13 trials here. Um, what I want you to note is over on the condition side, it says GIST or NTRK fusion GIST or SDH GIST or NF1 GIST. That's not what it says in clinicaltrials.gov. Basically it just says GIST or solid tumors. We know uh, from experience which of these trials are pertinent to which specific subtype of GIST. So the biomarkers or the genotype is important in understanding which clinical trials would be relevant to my particular situation. Um, the first trial here is the KIT inhibitor NB003. It's a drug uh, actually developed by AstraZeneca and it had a prior name AZD3229. Uh, AstraZeneca sold the rights to a firm in China uh, called Nubay. And Nubay, about a year ago, told us they bought this and came to us and said, we're going to be opening a trial in the United States. And sure enough, it's here. So it's at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. It started in August and it's going until 2023. Uh, and it's going to enroll uh, 36 GIST patients. And the reason we're interested in this trial is uh, there was a, a paper published uh, by the scientists at AstraZeneca that stated AZD3229, the prior name, has a superior potency and selectivity profile to standard of care agents, imatinib, sunitinib, and regorafenib, as well as investigational agents at that time, avapritinib, that was blue 285, and repretinib, DCC2618. ACD3229 has a potential to be a best in class inhibitor for clinically relevant KIT PDGFRA mutation, uh, mutations in GIST. Um, so we read that, with, uh, we put a little salt on that because this is the, this is the, these are the scientists from the drug company talking, but uh, they did present some results that they showed in preclinical activity, which was very, very interesting. So we have an interest in that drug and are hoping that it uh, is going to perform well once it gets out there. The second drug, um, and by the way, that's a, uh, just a new mousetrap. It's a straight kit inhibitor. It's just a really good one. And uh, that's not the same as the second drug. This, uh, the second drug is not just a mousetrap. It's different. It's in what's called a DCC, DS6157A is an ADC or an antibody drug conjugate. This is an antibody that's coupled to a chemotherapy payload. And it turns out that just cancer cells have a surface protein, kind of like coronavirus, 
that is present only on GIST cells. It's, there's not just the CKIT protein, but there are other proteins that are unique to GIST tumors. And this one is called a GPR20 protein. And what, what this drug does is the antibody part of the drug attaches to this protein. And then there's a chemo payload of a, what's called a TOPO1 inhibitor. DXD is the name of it. And basically what you're doing is you're uh, sort of gluing a hand grenade to the side of the GIST cell. And uh, that chemo payload will interfere with the DNA replication in that cell and hopefully will kill the cell. So both of these trials will admit patients that are in the second and third line. Uh, they say uh, you must have imatinib uh, resistance and or are resistant to the second line therapy or have refused the second line therapy or are for other reasons can't take it. So it's tough to say whether it's a first line, second line or third line, but it's in there and you have to look at the actual exclusion inclusion criteria to really tell where you are. The third trial is a surgery trial. It's listed as surgery at the NIH. Um, and what you'll note is that the primary completion date is 2040. And that's real. It's a 20 year trial accruing 400 patients. And it's unique in that uh, the, the, it runs for 20 years, but it includes all the monitoring that one would have gotten if you would say had gone to the, um, the, the, the pediatric GIST and wild type clinic, which maybe some of you've heard about. I don't know if you knew this, but there was a specific clinic for that at the NIH uh, from about 2008 because of the rarity of that form of GIST. And the, the full resources of the NIH were available. Uh, which is really a good thing because the NIH has wide and deep resources in many areas, including not just the, the um, treatment of GIST, but in uh, things like uh, neuropathy, uh, endocrinology, um, heart disease, side effect management. Uh, and this particular trial is, is a little more unique than even the uh, GIST clinic, the pediatric clinic, in that it offers surgery. Dr. Andrew Blakely there will perform surgery if it's needed, but what the purpose of the trial is basically to monitor you and to uh, better understand the history of GIST and to characterize uh, different forms of GIST. And hopefully when you have surgery, he will be able then to remove tumor and begin to model it uh, using the actual tumor and not just the cells. Uh, his plan is to take the actual small tumors out and to treat them in patient serum to keep them alive for 72 hours and then to run a battery of characterization tests that just can't be done on the tumor microenvironment in any other context uh, like this. So we expect some really unique information to come out of this. And uh, Dr. Blakely is a, a, a well-regarded surgeon in GIST. So it's, a, it's an interesting trial. It doesn't necessarily involve treatment and uh, it can be a long-term from five to 10 years for a specific patient. The other trials on here that are for GIST are, we're primarily monitoring these to see what comes out of them. We're not necessarily recommending them. Uh, I won't go into detail on these except one, the MAAT cognitive therapy. This is at the University of Pittsburgh a Medical Center. Uh, sent, uh, Dr. Annette uh, Duenzing is behind this. She has studied cognitive uh, loss in GIST patients due to drugs. And this in particular trial is gonna use cognitive therapy therapy techniques to improve and to test and to measure the recapture of some of that cognitive loss. So it's a really interesting trial and uh, anybody with metastatic GIST can join it. At the bottom are uh, two trials I would mention here, the two, uh, the two uh, trials for NTRK fusions. These are extremely rare in GIST. Uh, there may be 20, 30 um, total a year out there that are, uh, you know, that come out of the, uh, the, the wild. And this thing is war wide, both of them, one's bare, the other one is uh, Hoffman LaRoche. They both have uh, NTRK inhibitors. And this is meant for a, a form of GIST that just had no treatment. It's, it's just like a miracle again. Uh, what we're seeing is a repeat of what happened with imatinib when it first came out, maybe even better. Uh, these patients have turned around this NTRK fusion, and it's across different forms of cancer. Uh, so there are several other forms of cancer that have it. They're not specifying a cancer type. All they need to know is that you have the fusion. So if you have a wild type gist and it can't, and it's not an SDH deficient, and you've been through the mill, 
you really need to check this NTRK out to see if possibly this is a solution. The second two trials are an SDH GIST. We're hopeful for these, but we're, again, there's nothing right now for SDH GIST. And these two trials are gonna offer something in, that we really have not had a consistent uh, clinical trial uh, package for SDH deficient GIST patients. And now we have two. The last one is for NF1 GIST. And um, it, it came up recently. Uh, we've had a couple of patients who've had it. And uh, many of them use an off-label, well, they can use an off-label label drug called silametinib, but this particular drug is being tried specifically in patients who had FNF1 disease and F1 mutations. And we listed it even though it does not indicate GIST in the, uh, in the description. So these are the current uh, non-immunotherapy trials. Immunotherapy drugs in trial for GIST include apilimumab, nivolumab, Avalumab, spartalizumab. That last one is not approved yet by the FDA. The others are all uh, approved and have been in trials for GIST. Uh, they come from PD1, PDL1 uh, checkpoint inhibitors primarily. This is an axis on the cell that when it's inhibited, uh, it makes the cell uh, accessible to the immune system, the adaptive immune system. Cells, uh, GIST cells are really notorious, well, all cancer cells are, notoriously can hide from the immune system. And so what these checkpoint inhibitors do is they hide the, the uh, shield uh, that Harry Potter might have used to be invisible. They pull that shield off and make it a, a vis visible again to uh, the immune system. Now, immune system drugs are notoriously effective in about 20% of patients when they're effective in a particular cancer. We really haven't seen a big response in these historic trials uh, for immune drugs, but there's always help that we find the right combination. Uh, we did have a patient back in 2013 or so in California who responded very well. We think it was to a pilimumab. He had been uh, a hospice candidate uh, bedridden, uh, cognitively impaired, and he came back uh, to riding his Harley David's motorcycle for a couple of years. Uh, he did pass away from just eventually, but he really got a benefit from, from this drug. And so he's one patient we know of. Um, I, um, I'm looking here at what's recruiting right now in immunotherapy trials, and it's really limited. Uh, we have two trials in the US. Uh, one of which is due to finish up here uh, next month. It's the one uh, that I would recommend. It's at UCLA. Um, Bristol, -Myers -Squibb is, Bristol, -Myers, Bristol Myers Squibb is a co-sponsor. Uh, a trial of uh, epilimumab or epilimumab plus nivolumab. And it's a phase two trial. And it's under Dr. Aaron Singh, who has treated just patients. The second trial is at MD Anderson in Houston. Uh, it's GIST plus eight other cancers, so it's not as focused on GIST, but it's an interesting combination because it includes a matinib, and it will accept GIST patients, and it's continuing through 2022, and the NCI is a co-sponsor of that trial. The international trials um, pretty much are restricted to patients who are in the country, uh, so if you live in Poland, that would be your choice, uh, the first one. The same for France and South Korea. Um, so these are interesting. Uh, we're looking for any kind of activity here in order to maybe guide future decisions about immunotherapy trials and just here in the US. So that's a picture of what's available in immunotherapy trials. I wanted to show this map because um, it's, it's of all the trial sites and the trials that got Gleevec, Sutent, Stavarga, Quinlock, and Aviacid approved. The numbers represent how many trials had a site in that state. For example, the number five in Illinois means that Illinois contained at least one site for five of the 16 trials in the search. The bottom line is that if you live in one of the states that is not a shade of red, you're likely to travel to a clinical trial. And even if you live in a Massachusetts or Pennsylvania with a lot of trials, you're, uh, you, know, you may not find that the trial you want is at Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. Each site has a different mix of trials and the doctors at those sites tend to recommend what they have there. So you really need to look around at what is available generally. And we know patients who have done trials in one state and then moved on to another center and done a trial in another state. That was our case because simply it's what's available and what works, okay? All right. So. What's the current issue that's going on uh, clinical trials since COVID? 
uh, telemedicine. And we found this resource uh, about telehealth. It tells what states have waivers and allow telehealth visits. Uh, so you need to know where you are and what state you're in in order to tell if you can have a doctor in say Florida do a remote telemedicine visit with you and help you participate in the clinical trial. So I did Illinois here. Illinois is open and active till the end of uh, a disaster proclamation here coming up very shortly. So we'll see what happens after that, but Illinois is fairly well set up, uh, not so in every other state. And so what's happening is that doctors who have uh, seen the, the benefit of telehealth are saying, we're not going back and they're sending up the alarm. And this is a live session on Twitter. Uh, Titania Prowl posted about doctors who no longer can get televisits uh, because of the rest restrictions that are being put back in place. George Dimitri agreed. John Trent was following it and also retweeted it. So it's a very hot topic right now in GIST. Okay, clinical trials. Um, British soldiers are called Limeys for a reason. And I'm gonna just say one thing. This was a trial conducted in about 1752 and involved uh, giving British sailors uh, different mixes, uh, including everything down to sulfuric acid. And one set of patients got oranges and lemons and that those, those did well. It took 42 years before the British Navy actually adapted a standard that would allow uh, for use of these citrus-based drugs to provide for a loss of vitamin C at sea. And the British, soldier, or British sailors were dying more of scurvy than they were of uh, battle in, uh, in that context back in 1750. So that's how long it took for a trial to get approved or a drug or a change to get approved back then for the very first trial. Um, this is the history of, of just uh, trials uh, from our background. And uh, what I've done is a post, I tried to show here the number of patients recruited in these trials, as well as when the drugs were approved. So over 18,000 patients went through the trials that were uh, primarily to get these drugs approved. And you can see here the uh, number of trials that were in effect in, in this time period. Uh, and, and we had up to 140 trials in this period. Uh, and here are the, the main points. Gleevec in 2002, uh, Sutin was approved in 2006, adjuvantamatinib in 2008, for one year, for three years in 2012, Stavarga, roughly early 2013, and then recently Ivakit for D842 and Kinlock for Algist in 2020. So it's been a very um, good picture for GIST patients. We have a lot of trials and we have a lot of approved drugs. So, um, Looking at a clinical trial, one, one thing some, you need to be aware of is to look at the exclusion criteria uh, when you're making a choice and trying to understand how to proceed. Some trials preclude prior use of a drug you may want to try. So what you want to do is you want to consider the trial first and then the drug after. You want to sequence your um, options based on what the trials allow and don't. So you got to pay very close attention to the exclusion in clinical trials. Uh, the imatinib trial was unique. Um, if you see, see the green arrow here, that is patient zero who received imatinib in March of 2000. We had an approved drug by February of 2002. The uh, number of just patients recruited was unheard of, uh, 746 in the US and 946 in Europe and uh, Australia and outside the US. Uh, this was just absolutely compressed in less than two years. And um, you can see the CML data there shows the drug was approved in 2001. Uh, we were approved shortly after that in 2002. This is just really a unique situation. Compared to the Sunitinib trial, that was, uh, that was uh, like a tidal wave that uh, just washed ashore. And then this was more like a change of tides. <laughs> and uh, you can see the phase two went from 2002 to 2004. The phase three uh, followed right after and it overlapped it, uh, but drug didn't get approved until mid early 2006. And then there was this expanded access trial. David talked about real world evidence. They actually recruit 
1,100 patients in the, in the uh, expanded access trial, uh, which was worldwide, and uh, helped fill in the gap when this drug wasn't approved in each, uh, each uh, approval area, like the FDA and ours in, the, in Europe, the, each, each country has its own approval authority. So this expanded access trial helped fill in the gap between the availability in the US and availability elsewhere. And it provided a lot of data. Uh, it actually showed that patients who stayed on suit instead of getting off of it on progression did better. And it also confirmed the results of the trial. So there are phase three trials that did not succeed. Uh, we had one in 2007-8, uh, Lilotinib, enrolled 248 patients in phase three. It did not succeed in progression-free survival. We had an IPI 504 trial, which was a uh, heat shock protein 90 inhibitor, and that failed because of a toxicity issue with two patients who passed away in Japan, and it was believed or couldn't be determined that it wasn't the drug, and so they stopped the trial, and that drug never went any further in GIST. Um, we recently had a report from um, another trial of abapritinib that compared it to regorafenib. And avapritinib did not succeed except for D842V gist. It only succeeded in that setting and not in the general setting of fourth line um, gist in general. And the reason was there was no significant difference in median progression free survival between the two trials. There are off label drugs in gist. Uh, I would just show you this list. Uh, these are drugs that never got to phase three, or in the case of nilotinib, did but didn't succeed. And it shows the median progression-free survival. We know there's activity here. Um, and of course, there were significant numbers of GIST patients participated. Um, and this is from a recent article by the team at the University of Miami, Sylvester Cancer Center, John Trent, uh, which I, I think I've included in my list. I'll send you in a minute. So, um, so it's important to know that other drugs do have uh, off-label uh, use in GIST. So expanded access trials, I mentioned these, they're defined as uh, the use of an investigational drug when the primary purpose is diagnose, monitor, or treat a patient's disease or condition, rather than to obtain the kind of information about the drug that is re generally required by the FDA. Um, so the FDA has a long history of supporting this. And um, our history with it has been, there was none in, in the in phase, one, phase three imatinib trial, but actually the phase three trial itself was very similar to an expanded access trial. And uh, there have been in each of these trials, notably all the other trials below here, sunitinib down to ripuretinib, are trials that involve the placebo. And so this is provide a way for patients who cannot go into placebo trial because of their condition uh, to be able to access the drug outside the trial. So I wanna talk about my daughter. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly uh, go through her history. Um, she was diagnosed at age 23 in 1991 with multifocal, multifocal gastric gist, surgeries three in 91, 94, 98, multiple chemotherapies, multiple hospitalizations, and uh, significant incidences of tumor bleeding in that context. In 2001, at age 33, she was re-diagnosed as gist, participated in the phrase, phase three Gleevec trial, uh, because of tumor bleeding, she could not succeed in the trial. She had to leave the trial. Tried Gleevec off-label, again, bled with off-label use of Gleevec uh, as she ramped up to 600 milligrams, and we could no longer take Gleevec. So by the time of September of 2001, we had a miracle drug, and we could no longer take that drug. In 2002, no treatment and growth. Uh, we found out, uh, unfortunately, we were we were uh, diagnosed as an exon 11 point mutation. That was not correct. Uh, that was because of the early nature of how uh, drugs were tested and uh, mutations were tested. Nancy went into the phase three sinitinib trial in 2003 and passed away because of a tumor bleed uh, in 2005 at the age of 38 on April 28th, 2005 after 16 days in the intensive care unit. In 2014, we had our tumor diagnosed and uh, it turned out the DNA showed uh, no SDH uh, mutations, no, G no kit mutations, and due to SDHB staining, it was SDH deficient. We believe it was an SDH epimutant uh, gist. And uh, um, Sutin, which is the trial Doug Nancy took in 2003, 
is one of the few drugs that has some activity, about 20% of patients, uh, SDH patients see some, some response or uh, stability on that drug. And Nancy got a response on that drug in 2003. Um, what's it like to be in a clinical trial? Um, you go to a lot of hospital rooms. <laughs> We have, Nancy collected all her bands, uh, I counted them, there are 54 that she had, uh, 54 hospital visits over time. And uh, I just wanted to show you a few pictures and go through the timeline, but I think I'm out of time. Sarah's looking at me saying, I, I have some questions. Uh, so let me uh, drop this share and I will um, go to the chat and send you a post here in a second. Thank you, Jim and David. Um, we have some time for a few questions if people want to chat it into the Q&A. Um, I just want to thank you both for each of your presentations. I think you gave a really good full picture of clinical trials within the GIST space. Um, I do want to thank David for mentioning the RWE. That's something that really is important to the Life Raft group. And I just want to encourage any patients on um, this webinar, whether live or the recording, to join the patient registry so that we can really follow you um, over time if you're in a trial or, or if you are a patient so that we can really track how you're doing. Um, and I'm going to um, kick it off with just a, a one question I got from an international patient. Um, if you could just describe the ease or the logistics of having an international patient um, join a U.S. clinical trial. Okay. Is that something that's complicated? Um, that, are there certain things that they need to keep in mind if they want to consider that an option? Good question. I mean, it's certainly possible. We've had lots of patients from Canada get out of U.S. clinical trials even if there isn't an arm in Canada, but it isn't easy. I mean, there's financial issues, of course. You got to get there. You got to get to the U.S. I mean, my, my sister-in-law came from Costa Rica to New York to get on the trial of Gleevec. Uh, there wasn't any difficulty getting on the trial, really. The issue was just getting, to, getting a plane ticket and getting to New York. Yeah, I think uh, the first patient uh, that took Gleevec was from Finland yep. and came to the United States uh, to Dana-Farber yep. to receive uh, the first dose of uh, imatinib, STI-571, for a GIST patient. So it's possible, but it's not easy. Right. Okay. So um, there is somebody who heard about a trial involving MEK inhibitors, but they didn't see that trial mm -hmm. on the list of U.S. trials. Do you know anything about this particular trial? And yes. I'm just going to chime in. This might be the Memorial Sloan Kettering one, Jim. It is, and it's um, it's no longer recruiting, so it's not listed in my list of trials recruiting in the United States. Uh, but it is available on our website. You can find it there, and you can also find it in clinicaltrials.gov. Great. Um, there's somebody who wanted to know about uh, trial database for trials happening or upcoming in Canada. Um, and I'm just going to chime in also with that, that the GIST trials links that we um, copied into the chat, they are- yeah, I'm finding I can't copy into chat. I'm having no luck with that. Oh, okay. So well, I, cop I, copied, I copied the GIST trials and the clinicaltrials.gov in there for people. Okay, thank you. Go in there. But um, for the person who asked about Canadian specific, you will be able to find um, locations all around the world listed in that international database. Yeah, uh, clinicaltrials.gov usually covers um, most Canada trials. And we find that there are registries in each country. Uh, they will double list. They'll list in the registry in the country and then they'll list in clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, it depends on the country. And somebody wanted to know, is cabozatinib on a, in a trial in the United States? Not right now. Uh, very good results in Belgium. Patrick Shofsky has published on it. Uh, it's on the list that I showed you of off-label drugs. Uh, that was a university-based trial. It was not funded uh, or really given a lot of support by the manufacturer. Uh, the manufacturer it was shopping that drug to sell it. I don't know if um, they're going to be funding a phase three trial here in the United States or what the next thing is for that drug. But okay. it's out there and it's uh, on the list of options. 
And I think uh, it might be in the NCCN guidelines as well. So you might be able to get it off labels. Paying for it might be another issue. Uh, so um, just two quick questions. If you had surgery on a primary tumor with high risk of reoccurrence and have no evidence of disease, would there be any reason to join a clinical trial to prevent reoccurrence? Um, the yeah. clinical trial that Andrew Blakely's running um, might be open to you. I don't know if you need to have a tumor present to be in that trial, but um, at high risk, um, you should be monitored uh, and you should be on a matinib. I mean, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Heike Yonsu in Finland for having started the clinical trial of adjuvant imatinib. That was a very controversial thing to do because it meant giving the drug on a clinical trial basis to patients who had no evidence of disease. And it took real courage to get that going. And of course, it proved to be a tremendously uh, valuable therapy. Thanks for pointing that it's out. It's a great example of a clinical trial, real pioneer, pioneering work. Um, just going back to the international case, does somebody need to have a U.S. health insurance to enroll in a clinical trial in the United States? No, no. No, okay. Um, we actually are out of time, um, but um, I, I'm going to close this webinar, but the, um, both Jim and David are available for questions. So, you know, we can always follow up with the recording with their contact information if people want to ask some follow-up questions. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank the presenters. As always, very enlightening, a lot of information shared. And I also just want to thank you for dedicating the presentations in memory of Elsa and also Nancy. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Take care. Bye now.